All right, so so let's get going, everybody. Uh, we're talking about the fourth decade of website deployments. It's Twin Cities Drupal 2023. I'm really excited to be here back in person at Twin Cities Drupal for the first time in four years. I've been coming to this camp for uh, a long time. I was at this camp back in 2018. That's the year that I moved up to Minneapolis. I had first come to this camp uh, when I was a Chicago resident and a Milwaukee resident. And in 2018, I talked about how WordPress was rewriting everything into a, a block. And then I moved up to Minneapolis like a, like a month later. Going back in time to 2012, that was my, my first time at Twin Cities Drupal. I was working for the agency Palantir.net, uh, owned and, and, uh, and uh, presided over by Tiffany Ferris, who was our, our uh, keynote speaker yesterday at Twin Cities Drupal 2012. I talked uh, about a contributed module. The presentation was titled Workbench for Wookiees. <laughs> I talked about how uh, different corners of the Star Wars universe might use the Workbench suite of modules. Han and Chewie would play very fast and loose with content approvals, presumably, whereas the Empire might have things totally locked down. If we go further back in time, 2007 is, uh, is about the time that I, I transitioned from semi-professional web developer to like, yeah, I'm a professional web developer. I found Drupal. It's the thing that's going to make this all possible. 2007, also the year the iPhone became available. I did not really realize at the time that I was starting my career in web development the same year as what I now consider to be the single biggest technological tipping point in the history of the internet. I mean, I'd love to say that 2001, the release of Drupal, was the single biggest technological shift in the history of the internet, but I, I think the iPhone had, had more influence. Going back to 1991, the beginning of the World Wide Web itself. We could go further back in time to 1984, the year Apple told us wouldn't be like 1984, also the year I was born. And we could go all the way back to 1970, which happens to be the beginning of the Unix epoch. All of our computers that are telling time, or many of them, are doing so by counting the number of seconds from January 1st, 1970. It's kind of weird to think about, but our computers are just constantly counting the seconds from this point in time. Often if you have a device that uh, runs out of battery, you might be surprised, like, wait, why are all the dates either uh, January 1st, 1970 or December 31st, uh, 1969? And it's because the computer ran out of battery. It's like, oh, I guess I'm just counting from zero again. Now, uh, we can also go forward in time when we get to the year 2038. The number of seconds since 1970 is going to get so big that it will break many of the data storage formats we rely upon to count time. It's already breaking some software because software is thinking out into these further years, especially insurance software is counting out uh, into the future. I mean, what's going to happen when we get out to 2070 and we're at 100 years of Unix time. I, I, I don't know if I'll still be making websites uh, all the way out then, but you know, I, I do sometimes think about the year 2055 when we will be uh, 32 years removed from where we are now. Like right now in 2023, we are 32 years removed from 1991. What's, gonna, what's it going to be like 32 years from now? I also felt like I had to get um, some date in the 2040s, and I, I didn't have one at the top of my head, so I was just Googling around, and I found that there's, there's some initiative to defeat death itself by the year 2045. Uh, found that on Wikipedia. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, uh, maybe by 2045, uh, I'll be wanting to defeat death myself. Uh, I, I'm not all that optimistic about it. So I, I, I want to start this, this presentation you know, with, with that grounding because the world of, of web development can be incredibly noisy. I have spent uh, too much of, of my life on uh, Twitter trying to keep track of the, the micro trends, what's happening today, this hour, this week, this month in the world of web development. And I, I sometimes just need to remind myself that we are on a very long time horizon. And the thing that's hot uh, today might not be the thing that's hot tomorrow or in the year 2055. And especially when we're at, at an event at a, at a university like this one that has been around for well over 100 years. 
the University of Minnesota and the University of Wisconsin have been playing football against each other longer than any <laughs> two other universities over a hundred years. And the, the stuff that we're doing in the world of web development is often microscopic, uh, counting the number of, of seconds on, on a time scale. So I have titled this presentation, The Fourth Decade of Website Development, but I, sh I should be upfront about the fact that most of this presentation will be talking about the first three decades of website development, because uh, one of my favorite quotes about the future is that the future is uh, arrived. There are actually a bunch of different versions of this quote. I tried to find like the real one. <laughs> there isn't one, but uh, the future has already arrived. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. So uh, I think we can more effectively prepare for the future by looking at what's already here and by looking at uh, what has come before us. So uh, we, we already did the, the big timeline of the internet. You can cross that off. Uh, I'll also, let me also turn off this, uh, this weird picture in picture thing, <laughs> enough of that. So we, we got the big timeline of the internet. Uh, next, we're going to talk about one of my favorite questions. What computer assembles the website? Can I get a picture? Yes, all right, a picture in picture here, maybe. No, maybe, let's see, picture in picture. That is not the picture that I want to be in the picture. That is not what I want. <laughs> That's not what I want technology. It's just going to keep going to camera one. All right. Well, you know what? Fair enough. I'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll use this camera for the picture in picture. All right. Uh, we'll talk about what computer assembles the website, one of my favorite uh, questions that can move us through the history of web development. We'll talk about why did decoupling catch on as a technological trend. Uh, we'll talk about some lessons from the single page application era of web development. We'll unpack the what I find to be an overwhelming amount of initialisms in web development, SSG, SSR, ISR, there are too many to, to keep track of. Uh, we'll talk about the, the trend, particularly in the, the 2010s, of micro-ifying everything, microservices, micro-frontends, and then, okay, what can we expect? Uh, based on all of that, what can we expect uh, in the remainder of the 2020s? All right, what computer assembles the website. This is, I find, a, a question that is, depending on how you look at it, deceptively simple or, or perhaps deceptively complex. In the last 32 years, there have been any number of computers and layers of computers at which a website can be assembled. There's, of course, the site visitors' computers themselves, laptops, phones, and whatnot. There's the developers' computer. Some parts of the website are assembled there. Drupal could be the computer, or the, the server on which Drupal is running could be the computer that assembles the website. There's also the front-end developer's computer, a CI server, uh, Node.js server, a CDN. It can be, a, this is somehow a simplified diagram, but I'm already feeling overwhelmed. So if you're feeling uh, overwhelmed, well, we'll talk through this uh, a little bit more slowly. Another angle that we can uh, look at this question is by uh, looking at it from a more human perspective. So yes, there's the question of what computer assembles the website. We can also look at it from a more human-centric angle. On what computer, commonly controlled by an IT department, do the templates, often written by developers and designers, meet the content? So being at a Drupal camp, we have uh, our own frame of reference here. Again, Drupal is often uh, the place where and oversimplifying it, where the templates meet the queried content, and we send out our HTML to, uh, to people visiting. But of course, that's not the only way to do it. If you were making websites back in the 90s, you might have been the webmaster, and your desktop computer, or perhaps more accurately, your brain was the computer that assembled the website. If there wasn't a clear distinction back then between what is content and what is the template, if there aren't templates at all, well then, okay, it is your human brain that is computing the website, transcoding it into flat HTML files, FTPing it up to a server that gets sent out to people visiting the website. That is the 90s way of answering this question. Moving forward into the 2000s, the LAMP stack became the widely accepted answer to this question. We'll still be uh, using developers, probably SFTPing, I hope, SFTPing instead of uh, FTPing up to a server. That server can run a language like PHP, it can connect to a database. 
Content editors can sign into the system like Drupal, do their content updates, those go into the database, and this becomes the system that uh, renders the website. And for a good number of years, this was stable, and it was, uh, I, I, certainly for me, and if you're in this room at a Drupal camp, you probably think this is a, a decent balance between those competing needs of IT developers, designers, and content editors. And then, in 2007, these devices came out. iPhones followed a few years later in 2010 by iPads, and suddenly, these servers were no longer the most powerful computer in the stack. Suddenly, as web developers, we need to reckon with the fact that it is our visitors who often have the single most powerful computer in the stack. It's a computer with an advanced chip. It's a computer that has an accelerometer. It turns. We need to deal with a device that goes from horizontal to vertical. These are problems that we had never had to deal with before. We had to solve for touch interactions in addition to mouse interactions. And so it uh, became reasonable, reasonable for uh, especially front-end developers to think this is perhaps an existential change to the way we think about the World Wide Web. These devices also have native applications that can more easily take advantage of the camera, more easily take advantage of the accelerometer, more easily take advantage of the touch uh, interactions. And Figuring out how to do that, working through the Drupal theming system or the WordPress theming system or Ruby on Rails or anything else, that felt like more friction than a lot of front-end developers wanted to deal with to figure out how do, we, how do we make a website work on one of these phones. And so they uh, often came to the conclusion, well, let's just write code that is friendlier to this device. This device is going to be executing JavaScript. Let's write more of our website code in JavaScript, send it out through a separate pipeline, perhaps send a nearly blank HTML page to the device, add in a whole bunch of JavaScript, and then we'll just query data from Drupal or WordPress. We got a, a relatively hard divide between the technology corresponding with a relatively hard divide between the front-end and back-end developer ecosystems. Now, this, of course, was not a universal experience, but plenty of web teams started, uh, started thinking this way. Now, the next point uh, of evolution that I, that I saw here was uh, the recognition that when you push more and more responsibility out to the end device, you sometimes get a better end result if that device is the single most powerful computer in the whole stack. But if it is, say, a low-end Android device on a slow cellular connection, you're probably going to have a pretty bad experience. You might run into security problems that uh, you hadn't considered if you're putting more responsibility in that end device. So uh, plenty of front end developers started to think like, okay, let's move responsibility back behind a CDN. That could be better for security. And one thing we as the front end development community really like about that is it lets us, the front end development community, start using these build processes and DevOps practices that have become uh, incredibly compelling in the 2010s, but somehow we as the front-end development community, we've been excluded from the DevOps community. And in order to, to work with these phones, we the front-end development community want something that's going to, to work for us. And, and if you don't mind, uh, I'm just going to start recording myself here because, you know, front-end developer, I, I, I need to record myself because, you know, I, I do work for Pantheon and we, we need to get more content for social media. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to do this portion talking uh, straight to my phone. Um, Dan, could you move a little bit out of, out of my shot? I'm, I'm, oh, out. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, uh, th this was an era where as teams got further and further separated, it became easy to, to get really focused on yourself and, and your own needs. And this, this style of development worked well for front-end developers who were looking at themselves and, and thinking about how do I make something that's going to work well uh, on the phone, but it didn't always work for their, their other teammates that they, they didn't want uh, in the shop. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that even qualified as a joke. I, I had decided to do that a few minutes before this presentation. Thank you for indulging me. Uh, all right. Uh, Server-side rendering of JavaScript uh, started to come back because uh, it was not incredibly effective to, to use this 
style of, of work that put all of the responsibility for assembling the website into the build server. Yes, that might have worked well for front-end developers who were thinking about their own developer experience, but for the content editors who have an expectation that we can edit content in Drupal or WordPress, hit publish, and immediately see it, if every single change to the website goes to a build process that can be multiple minutes long, that's a bad experience. So uh, it becomes easier to process that JavaScript on this side of the CDN. And maybe we can get the best of both worlds. Maybe the front-end developers can write in the JavaScript-centric tools they want. The content editors can still have their fast publishing experience. And we're still behind a CDN. This is what I, I consider to be the, the state-of-the-art way of, of doing things right now for, for many teams. I still love Drupal itself. My own website is a regular headed Drupal site. It's not decoupled. Uh, when I'm working alone um, on my own website, that makes sense for me. But for teams that do have a clear divide between front-end developers and back-end developers, it does make uh, a decent amount of sense to have a pretty clear technological divide as well. What I expect to be coming next, and again, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Making the CDN itself a layer I haven't talked about a whole lot here, uh, the layer that assembles the website. This is a layer that is primarily there historically for making the website faster, making the website more secure, more resilient against traffic spikes. But over the last few years, more and more responsibilities have been pushed into these CDN layers. We can talk about what computer assembles the website. We can also talk about something as narrow as, OK, what computer optimizes the image? If I'm uploading a 5 megabyte image to my Drupal or, or WordPress site, what's going to transform that into the WebP file? Like, Drupal has been doing that pretty well since image cache module and Drupal file. There have been a lot of Drupal-specific answers to that question. But the CDN can do it. And depending on how you look at it, the CDN might be doing it faster and better. It's my expectation that more and more responsibilities for assembling the website will continue to move here as costs come down, as the developer ergonomics get better, as performance considerations get worked out. All right, so I've, I've talked a bit about decoupled architectures. But I, I feel like I should talk uh, a bit more on, on why decoupling caught on in the world of website operations. All right, so did, did the monoliths just become scary? Um, I, I don't think so. Like, I, I work in Drupal, and I, I don't feel like I got scared of Drupal. But um, hold on, I'm, I'm realizing that my, uh, my presentation remote here kind of looks like this uh, black, scary monolith. Um, now feels inappropriate, because I'm going to talk about decoupled uh, website architecture. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to decouple my presentation remote. Uh, the, the next slide that, that I wanted to talk about talks about like website operations. De so while, while I decouple my presentation remote, um, I'm just going to play a video uh, version of, uh, of the slide that uh, I was going to do. Let's find that video. There we go. Hold on. The music is still playing. Get out of here, iTunes. I still call it iTunes. Does anyone else still call it iTunes? <laughs> All right. Let's see if this is going to work. I need your help. There's a big, huge problem with the website. Um, I was in the middle of something. Our CMO is furious that our CPL is way up. Uh, that sounds bad. It is. What? or who is a CMO? Chief Marketing Officer. Duh! Oh, right. And then what or who is a CPL? Double duh! Cost per lead. Why'd it go up? Ah, it looks like the cost per lead went up as CWV totally tanked. CWV? Duh! Core Web Vitals. OK, Steve, <laughs> so... Fix the Core Web Vitals? It's not that simple, Steve. The collapsing CWV correlates clearly with a cratering CHR in our CDN. So we need CTO, Steve. Chief Technology Officer. I know that one. Not so much the other two there. CTO, Steve. We need your help right now. So our content delivery network exists to provide 
cached copies of the website around the world. That's essential to making the website fast. Yeah, but Steve, the core web vitals are down, so the site isn't fast. True, that is accurate, Steve. For some reason, the CDN isn't caching, so our cache it ratio... CHR. Yes, the CHR is nil. What happened there to drop the CHR? After inspecting the CI-CD logs for our CMS, my now working hypothesis is that some old, fragile CCCC broke one. CCCC? That stands for Crufty Custom Cookie Code. Is that a real acronym? No, it's not. It's an initialism I made up. The CCCC broke when Steve, that new CRO contractor, updated a CTA. Ugh, so we need to talk to CRO contractor Steve? He's the worst! Hi, Steve. Am I getting fired? Maybe? No. <laughs> Last Thursday, you used the continuous integration and continuous deployment systems to update a call to action in the content management system. Yeah, I was just doing my job, some conversion rate optimization. That's what I'm here for. But Steve, why did you muck with the CSS selector so much? And what does CSS stand for? Cascading style sheets, Steve. 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 Right, CSS. I cleaned up the crufty custom cookie code because CIO Steve needed some CYA around the CCPA. You messed with the CCCC on purpose? Don't say CCCC. California consumer privacy is not a joke. I'll talk with the CIO about this. Oh no, CMO Steve just DM'd me. Steve, how's that CPL problem coming? It's a very complicated case, Steve. There are a lot of acronyms. Initial C C C C. No. Please just tell me who can fix it. Steve, Steve can. can. Uh, uh, I, I just realized I'm wearing the same sweater as CMO. <laughs> I did not think that through. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, uh, for, forgive me for that. I, I should probably be wearing developer Steve clothes. All right, uh, so I, I, think, I think I have successfully decoupled my presentation remote. Um, let's see. Yes, it worked. All right, so, you know, uh, even though things like monolithic Drupal have been prepackaged and have nice buttons and are reliable, sometimes it's more fun to just tear it all apart and make something that feels better, right? That's how I have felt as a developer sometimes. Like, let me get all the wires out. Let me make an actual electrical connection between uh, myself, these pieces of fruit, and uh, a USB keyboard. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, so I, I hope as that video um, illustrated, the last few years, the last decade plus in website operations has been hard for everybody, for pretty much every role. Uh, it, it's an, it, I think that's, that's an understatement. And a tough part about decoupling this thing is it sometimes registers uh, more than one click when I wanted to. All right, so the last decade for developers, the last decade for developers. You know, I, I got into web development and Internet Explorer 6, was actually Internet Explorer 5, was one of my biggest uh, hurdles. And I kept thinking, like, this is going to get easier. My college professor was like, this is going to be so much easier. It's 2006. We're not going to have to worry about browser compatibility problems soon because it's all going to be standardized in Adobe Flash. <laughs> and we won't have to worry about the compatibility problems. Uh, so that wasn't exactly accurate, but I still have kept the expectation that it's going to get easier to make a website that just works on all the different devices and browsers. But does it actually feel that much easier? Uh, not, not as much as I uh, expected it to. And the silver bullet architecture that seems to be on the horizon somehow stays one to five years away. For people in uh, communications or marketing roles, we've gone from like the MarTech 500 to the MarTech 8,000 to the MarTech 10,000. It is an overwhelming number of tools uh, to keep up with. And for IT specialists, it hasn't gotten that much easier either. Like, okay, you might not be managing the servers in the basement anymore, but AWS has like 
think literally over 100 different products to keep track of. And if you're in this role, you might be expected to understand what all 100 of those things actually do. And that, uh, that, that's unreasonable in, in my opinion. All right, uh, one of the common architectures that, that I talked about in that uh, timeline of website development was single page applications. And uh, I think right now we are pendulum swinging away from uh, some of the, the ups and downs of single page applications. And I'd, I'd like to, to represent that, uh, if possible, um, with, uh, with, with a metaphor. And, and I need a volunteer for this. So raise your hand um, if you're willing to volunteer, uh, if, if you haven't uh, rehearsed uh, this before, and you're a coworker that I, I pre-planted uh, in the audience for this. <laughs> oh, yes, me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, me is here. Uh, Yes, so uh, Yasmin, uh, if you could, uh, could you represent uh, Drupal as the, the back-end uh, architecture and uh, the, the, the uh, you know, the going forward buttons there? Th that'll represent the front-end uh, single-page application. Uh, I'll be saying, like, yeah, next, you know, next uh, uh, slide, and that's like a request between front-end and back-end. So there are some good things with uh, single, the single-page application architectures. Next. Let's see what are some of the, the good things. So there's, you know, it, as I was mentioning earlier, it's easier to experiment with the touch screen capabilities. It's you know, easier to figure out the orientation of screens, responsive designs, if we're writing our code directly in the language that's going to run on the browser. We can access the cameras, the accelerometers. Uh, we can pioneer more effectively. Now, but there are some downsides to this as well. Uh, so next, let's see what some of the, uh, the downsides are. You know, we, we might have uh, negative effects uh, of, of performance, um, like uh, uh, next, can we talk about how things slow down? So if you have an inexpensive, if it's an inexpensive device running the single page application, it may not feel as performant. Uh, next, please. Uh, if it's a weak cellular connection, it might feel slower. Uh, next, uh, please. If you have a, like a really data-heavy page, like if you're making uh, requests that bring in lots of data from the front end to the back end, it, it may also feel uh, may also feel slower. Uh, next, please. Uh, you might need to reinvent some browser behavior. You know, if you're doing this in, in the early 2010s, um, can you hit next? Uh, um, you might need to reinvent uh, some. There were like those scrolly things that happened a lot with single page applications. Um, huh. Uh, I wonder if we should go, can you like touch the other piece of fruit to go to get like maybe hit, hit back? Um, right, let, let's, let's just go forward a couple times. Uh, you might need to reinvent uh, browser behaviors. Um, yeah, hit it, hit it again, please. Uh, browser behavior, one, the spinning. Uh, one more, one more, please. Might need to reinvent browser behavior like, next, please. Uh, <laughs> next, please, like, the back button. You might need to reinvent browser behavior like the back button. Uh, thank you, thank you for coming along on that long walk. <laughs> that kind of joke. Uh, all right, uh, next. Well, what are some of the other downsides with single page applications? You could have, okay, you could have downtime, you could have security leaks if you're not thinking about like the variables that you're sending out to your templates. If you're used to you know, using variables that may be sensitive on your, your back end and now you're in the front end, you might be exposing things. Uh, okay, what else? Uh, next, please. Next. Uh, when? Next. Uh, when one? Next. Um, uh, when one page? Next. Uh, next, please. When one page requires, next, uh, please. When one page requires, next, uh, ne too many, uh, next, please. Too many requests, the, when one page, next, please. When one page requires too many requests, the SPA, single page, next, uh, single page application can, uh, next, please. When one page requires too many requests, the SPA can, next, please, uh, cr can create, next, uh, and uh, unintended, next. DDoS, uh, next, please. Uh, on, next, please. Uh, your next, please. Uh, your CMS, uh, next, please. When one page requires uh, a D DDoS stands for distributed denial service attack, next, please. Also, next. <laughs> Deal, next. You have to, also, next, please. Also, you have to deal with requests, next. Order, 
You'll also, next please, also you have to deal with requests loading out of order. That's it, okay, next, please, yikes. Or in bunches, all right, next. I think we're done here. All right, uh, please give yes me a round of applause. All of my coworkers deserve rounds of applause for, for putting up with me. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, let's let's now unpack uh, some of those initialisms. So so I use the initialism there, single page application, and, and talked about uh, how single page applications can can go bad. And, and I want to make sure we're all on all on the same page on some of these uh, initialisms. So well, let's just get them all uh, out here. There's uh, SSG, SSR. SPA, SPA, ISR, DPR, and CSR. And uh, if you don't know what these stand for, like, we'll, we'll get it pretty easily here. SSG stands for Static Site uh, Generation. Uh, SSR, um, you know, I, I'm starting to think that, that this may not be the best way um, of explaining this. Uh, I think I think the reason that this is hard to understand is, is because it's a slide. You know what? We're in person, right? We're in person at a camp, and I, I've heard uh, I've heard that you know it's just easier when it's in person, right? So let, let's do another in person thing. Like if, if I can get another volunteer who hasn't rehearsed with me before, and there's also another coworker I pre planted specifically for this bit. Seth, please oh, come up here. Oh, All okay, right. Of course. So, uh, so Seth, we've been hearing about the importance of like getting back into the office and in-person work. So even though this, you know, this doesn't really make sense, it's going to make sense when we do it in person over here. All right. So let's talk about these, these initialisms. Let's just get them out on the board. There's SSG. We'll get them out here fast. Static site generation. That's that pattern where it's commonly like a build server uh, generating HTML files, maybe all from the Git repository, maybe from your CMS. The next one is SSR, server side rendering. I mean, that's just a fancy word for what like Drupal has been doing the whole time. But now that it's in Node.js, it's somehow cool. But it's basically <laughs> what Drupal has been doing the whole time. Okay, so the next one we got. Files, single page applications, that's, that's the thing that we were talking about before. Let's not think of this as like web URLs that we're learning. Let's just think of like we're making a, a, an application. All right, the next one, client side rendering. That's the thing that uh, the SPAs rely on, the idea that we're going to render everything uh, in the client, in the browser, and that's going to be somehow better maybe. Next, next is uh, ISR. I sometimes forget what this one is. Uh, incremental, what's, what is it? Static. <laughs> static. What? Render, regeneration. I thought it was rendering. It's incremental static regeneration. And the last one is DPR? Uh, distributed, per, distributed persistent rendering. Uh, yikes. Okay. Uh, so I thought that this would make more sense in person. Uh, raise, raise your hand if these initialisms actually feel comprehensible, though. Uh, probably not. OK. Um, things make more sense in person, right? So let, let, this is a twister board. What, why did I do it? So let's bring this down on the floor. You know, this will make more sense if we group together some of the words. Um, a lot of these words are repetitive. We've got like. Rendering on here a bunch. Uh, site is a, Seth, could you spin the, the thing? And I'm gonna just gonna grab all the places rendering here. Where should I put rendering, Seth? Right foot yellow. Right, right foot yellow. Okay. Uh, and then page is or generator is on here. Regeneration. Where should I put generation and regeneration? Right hand green. Right, right hand. Okay, I'm there. Uh, and left hand blue. Left, uh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm experiencing downtime, Seth. <laughs> okay, uh, please, please applaud for Seth. Uh, uh, so, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'm of the opinion that we shouldn't have to keep track of all of these things. This is an overwhelming number of words to keep track of. Uh, when we're just trying to make websites. And when I got started in Drupal, I didn't have to think about the fact that like server-side rendering was a fancy thing in need of its own uh, uh, initialism. And the, the, the direction we're trying to go um, at Pantheon is, is requiring web development teams to think about these distinctions less. If you have to be thinking about these distinctions, 
all day, every day to interact with your teammates, you're going to fall over. Um, the, <laughs> the next uh, trend that I, that I want to talk about that uh, is entangled with, with that mess is, is the trend of micro-ifying everything, microservices. Who here has heard of micro front ends? Okay, uh, that for for those uh, for those watching uh, the recording, that was like maybe twenty percent of the audience. When I first heard of micro front ends, I thought it was a developer Twitter fever dream. I, uh, I spent too much time on Twitter during the pandemic, and especially on weekends, web developer Twitter would go wild with silly ideas, and I thought. Micro front ends are one of those silly weekend ideas. I did not realize that they were a real thing that people were doing. The real thing is like, oh yeah, you can have your page, and if one portion of your page is gonna be built by React, and another portion is gonna be built by Vue, and another portion is gonna be built by, back end, uh, by Backbone, that's all fine, micro front ends. Uh, Yvonne is shaking his head uh, with, uh, with uh, a certain amount of Disgust. All right, I was going to say disdain, but that felt too strong, but he says disgust. So yes, uh, I, I think this is a, a little silly. I mean, okay, sh I can see how in some situations it may make sense to do. So th these are screenshots from like the real, I thought this was a joke. I thought this was a joke, but these are screenshots showing how it is a real thing. I don't want to spend, we're running short on time, but it's a real thing. Uh, <laughs> In addition to that techno technological micro, micro, micro Isaac, that's not a word, but I'll go with it. Uh, there was a, that same dynamic was playing out on a company level. In the 2010s, you could make very niche companies, companies uh, that do just like uh, the handling of mono repos, companies that just do visual regression tests, companies that just do package management. And in the 2010s, when everything is becoming micro, okay, yeah, you can get funding to do that. But as the 2010s move along, as we enter the 2020s, people start to ask, how many, how many monthly bills do I need for one website? And there's consolidation happening. Uh, seeing we're, we're short on time, uh, I won't spend uh, too much time on the Pantheon architecture diagram, but we're looking to solve this challenge by bringing more uh, parts of, of a decoupled web architecture under one roof. So let's talk about what to expect in the, in the 2020s. So uh, the trajectory of, website, of the website operations zeitgeist in the 2020s to points towards bundling and combining. In, 2020, in the 2020s, web developers will directly use fewer tools, uh, but those tools will be bigger. And in other ways, those tools will be smaller. So that, that's a quote uh, from me right now, um, hedging my bets with an unfalsifiable statement. Some things are going to get bigger, and some things are going to get smaller. So one thing I've noticed in the past few years in the front-end development ecosystem is that front-end frameworks, uh, this is a, a, a real quote from the creator of, of Astro, uh, reflecting a similar mindset of Astro, Next.js, and many of the other front-end applications, they are taking more responsibility for more parts of how the web application <laughs> is put together. Uh, instead of you know, sending uh, everything out to the, the server and, and or sending everything out to the client and, and letting it figure out uh, what's, what the web page is supposed to be, we can get some performance enhancements by moving things uh, back to the server, back to a CDN, perhaps, and the framework, Astro or Next or any other, can take more responsibility. Very different from uh, the mid-2010s when Create React app was the dominant way of getting started, and it would bring along with it a bunch of dependencies and let you figure it out, because at that point in history, when there was a lot of innovation happening, it, it seemed unrealistic to say, you know what, this is the way to do it. But after a decade or so of, of front-end frameworks, the, these maintainers of Remix, FeltKit, Next, do feel appropriately confident that they can say, you know what, there's, there's a good way to do routing, and, and we're going to do it this way. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's my expectation that in the 2020s, we're pushing more and more things to the edge, to that CDN, those data centers that are physically closer to all of us, rather than like the one data center that holds uh, your Drupal database. Uh, Dino, the 
depending on how you look at it, the successor to Node.js is thinking in this mindset, like let's deploy executable code all over the world. Cloudflare has probably been the uh, the company most on the forefront here. They've been they've been doing this for years with their Cloudflare Workers product, and Fastly is doing it as well with WebAssembly. I like to think about these dynamics in terms of competing pressures. So that these pressures are always felt upon us, in, in my opinion. There's always some pressure to make things bigger and consolidated, and there's always some pressure to make things smaller, more atomized, and, uh, and expect any given team to, to figure out uh, how to assemble all the pieces. There's the mental pressure on both of these sides, the mental pressure to have fewer things to worry about if we make things bigger and consol consolidated. But if we atomize and we isolate, then perhaps we can reason about these things in isolation. There's the economic pressure. Maybe have fewer monthly bills. That could be nice. But if you atomize just right, perhaps you can optimize for a lower utility cost. Uh, maybe. There's the, so the societal pressure. We heard yesterday uh, from Tiffany, go farther together. If, if you want to go fast, go alone. Um, and there's that pressure to go solo to, to trailblaze on your own. But Drupal has been much more on the side of let's go far together and perhaps uh, not as fast. There's time pressure. When you're bigger and you're consolidated, inertia can carry you forward into the future. Like We can assume that Drupal is still going to be here tomorrow because of how large and uh, uh, how large the community is. But if you work with smaller, more atomized things, you might be able to get off the ground faster and have uh, less to figure out. There's, uh, <laughs> I have found the technological pressure to like find the silver bullet, consolidate everything that can solve it all. That's part of what Drupal uh, uh, used to appeal to me in the, in the late 2000s, the idea that like I can use Drupal to solve everything. Uh, but if we make things smaller and more atomized, then we can perhaps perfect each piece, which also feels good. So I don't think any of these pressures are going away, uh, but they ebb and flow, and it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to to balance them. Uh, I've I've you know made some jokes here, talked about um, you know, doing things in in person. I, I, I talked about you know my own history with with Drupal Camp Twin Cities um, back at, at Drupal Camp Twin Cities. Uh, 2016, at the after party, there were the uh, the lightning talks, and the lightning talks are often meant to be funny. So I decided to uh, to break out my uh, my Al Gore impersonation from my sketch comedy days, and it you know it went it went well. Uh, people people liked uh, Al Gore giving what was just like a totally straightforward presentation about continuous integration and and Drupal that went well. And then uh, three years later, I did a, a a conference talk at DevOps Days Minneapolis as Al Gore. Uh, and in, uh, in trying to figure out what Al Gore would say uh, about DevOps and trying to think a little bit outside the box, I, I stumbled upon something that, that actually felt very true to me. Even though like, I wrote this to sound funny, it also feels true. Uh, just I won't do the Al Gore voice right now, but just as DevOps days turn into DevOps nights, so too does the pendulum of the technological zeitgeist swing back and forth between monolithic systems and distributed systems. I think that's true. Even though I wrote that to sound funny, I do think it's true that we were constantly swinging back and forth between the mainframes of decades ago to uh, PCs, iPhones uh, as a form of atomization, moving everything back into the cloud. Oh, wait, no, the cloud has downsides. Let's move some things back on premises. These balances will always be rebalancing. So it's important for us to think about how do we set our teams up for success? What is the balance that is going to work for our team and our situation? What balance can make sense now? And hopefully set us up for success years into the future, because it's my expectation that like the University of Minnesota is still going to be here for decades and decades to come. It's my expectation that the University of Minnesota and many of our companies will still have websites for decades and decades to come. How do we set our teams up for success so we don't end up back in that bad place where your CMO is mad that the CPL is up, the CWV is down? Uh, let's, let's stay in the good place. And when we can, let's gather in person and, and figure out some things that we can't figure out as well online. Thank you so much.
Are there any questions? Yes, Dan. Did you, did you know that your banana was the on the camera for, for the second half of your presentation? Uh, I intended that, but I often forgot about it. And as you mentioned it, I realize I unconsciously picked this thing up, even though I had intended to be using this thing. And uh, you know what, probably for the best that I didn't. That is, I don't recommend using a banana as a keyboard. Even though you can use a banana as a keyboard, uh, don't recommend it for everyday usage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll I'll be around. Uh, happy to chat more. And let's uh, let's have a good lunch. <laughs>